so hi everyone welcome to the this andoa series i'm really excited about today uh last week you know we began a conversation about mental health and uh, and families and today we're, co con we're continuing that conversation with carol uh, who's with me tonight and um uh, and and the reality or what we keep saying in this video series is that marriages go through challenges every marriage will go through a challenge and and uh, my prayer is that as we go through this video uh, series is that they're equipping you they're equipping your marriage you're equipping you in your marriage so that you can better cope uh, with the challenges that you're coming uh, across so today we're going to be talking about uh, personality disorders with carol uh, she needs no uh, introduction she you know we came across her last week uh, she's actually a counseling psychologist and um uh, who's working, you know, with adult populations, working even with uh, marriage, with couples, and uh, very knowledgeable. And we are so thankful, uh, Carol, that you are able to join us um, and that we're able to do this uh, video series. Uh, and so we'll jump right at it. And I'm just going to ask you, what are personality disorders? What in the world is that? <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited, Pastor Carol, that you thought about talking about uh, personality disorders. They are more common than we want to imagine, though we do not have data about them. And the reason is because the diagnostic process of uh, saying somebody has a personality disorder is really lengthy. The tests are also not easy. So you find even a lot of us, therapists, counselors, psychologists, whatever term you want to use, not many are equipped to actually conduct a personality test. But in clinical work or in therapy work, we have seen the damage that they can do. So I'm very happy that you're talking about them. And uh, a personality disorder, even just the term when you hear personality, this already says it's about you and how you think and how you behave and how you feel. So by description, it was to be very basic and very simple for our listeners. Personality disorders are actually a mental disorder. Maybe that's what many people do not know. We wow. do not separate them from mental disorders. And how they present is that a person has rigid and very unhealthy patterns of thinking, functioning, and behaving. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Deeply, and they don't just, it's not something that is in a day or two. Yeah. So there's rigidity. And, unhealthy, and a very unhealthy pattern of thinking, functioning, and behaving. Okay. Personality now, disorders normally do not have an early diagnosis. Uh, clinicians or practitioners in mental health are very careful not to give it like in childhood. So most of the diagnosis is done in early adulthood. It usually has a higher manifestation in boys or in men than in women. So you find diagnoses are done like from about 19 years to about 25 yeah. years old. And okay. that's a very critical age. I think that's when we are beginning to date. Yeah. Yeah. The manifestation is later. You may just find yourself with somebody who didn't you didn't see the traits. They come out yeah. later when you've already said I do. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. so now personality disorder, it's a way somebody thinks, it's a way that they relate, and you said especially, you know, it becomes a problem uh, when, when someone displays very rigid and unhealthy patterns of thinking and functioning. Uh, so, okay, so maybe you can describe to us, um, you know, just some common ones. I think um, in an earlier conversation, we had talked about the narcissistic and the dependent uh, personality mm -hmm. disorders. So, okay, so just describe who, okay, what, is, what does it mean to be narcissistic? You, just, <laughs> you know, just define for us both of these and um, yeah, we take it from there. Wonderful. Maybe before I even define for you for the sake of the people listening to us who may not fall under this, uh, the one we shall talk about today, which is narcissism and uh, the dependent personality. There are different types of personality disorders. We usually cluster them into three clusters. Cluster A has about three of them. These are basically the ones we call odd or eccentric. Even you observing this person, something looks unusual. And when I mention them, you realize it's actually unusual. Yeah. 
Yeah. A person who has paranoid personality, you yeah. know? Uh, schizoid personality. Schizoid personality are those people who just don't like people. They don't wow. want to be around people. So we tend to think they are shy, but they don't like people. They are yeah. alone as they alone, okay? Yeah. And then well, something we call schizo schizotypal personality, which yeah. is highly confused for schizophrenia, mental condition because yeah. of the, the, the components of it. We won't go into details, yeah. but it's good to mention them in passing. Cluster B personality disorders, we describe them as the dramatic, overly emotional, and very unpredictable. Your behavior pattern is very unpredictable. Yeah. Interestingly, in this cluster, people may not even think they have a personality disorder because we describe them as confident, charming, easygoing, lovely to be around, opinionated, before you realize it can be a problem, especially for an intimate partner. And under this category, we'll be discussing one of them today, but under this category, we have antisocial personality disorder. When we say the word antisocial personality, people think it's that person who doesn't talk. No, 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 no. Antisocial means the way your life is very deviant. It's opposite of what the society expects. Mm -hmm. Right, so these are people who are more prone to uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. uh, gambling, you know, committing crime. Okay, all the yeah, they live against the, the, the societal norms. Okay? So they're just um, the people we just call um, you're having your uh, is it deviant? No, I don't want to use the word oh, deviant, but yeah, yeah, a, deviant. Uh, okay. deviant yeah. okay, yeah, you live against the societal norms, yeah. Okay. And they're very gifted and can be very high achievers, but they have all this chickenness. Okay, you, you said that, yes, they are deviant. And then you yes. said that they, they are high achievers. Yes, they can be very high achievers, uh, having very good jobs, but they just live a life that is very, very questionable. Because if you're in drug abuse, you may be trafficking, you may not even be using, or these corrupt deals that people go into, which look looks normal because we've normalized too many things in our society yes but we know these are behaviors which you have to do undercover because if you're caught in light where do the deviant people belong yeah. somewhere isn't it? yeah they become friends of the state they yeah become like the, the state of a guest <laughs> the guests of the state <laughs> so they are yeah. done undercover we have accepted them and it's easy to accept and social behavior from an outsider, but it's very difficult to accept it from a family member or an intimate partner that you're yeah. living with, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in this category is also borderline personality disorder. Uh, borderline personality disorder is very many times also confused for bipolar. In the clusters B, uh, so I mentioned antisocial and another one is borderline personality disorder. Okay, uh, borderline personality disorder is usually confused for bipolar mental condition, all right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the difference can only be made by a very well-trained clinician or mental health worker through assessment. And even in the assessment, when we do the test that we do, you may score, you may find a client or a patient has scored highly in the two. In borderline, there are what issues? Psychodynamic, psychodynamic, psychodynamic issues. childhood issues, pertinent okay. childhood issues. Yeah. Uh, in borderline, there it's basically like a very lost identity. This yeah. person lives like not knowing really who they are, what is their identity. All yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Then in the cluster B is also another personality called histrionic personality. This yeah. is where you draw attention to yourself. Okay. In yeah. layman languages, we just say your uh, attention. Self yeah. yeah, attention. You like drama, people having attention on you. Mm -hmm. And then we have the narcissist, which we'll be talking ab about today, the narcissistic personality. Uh, key components of the narcissistic personality, they are quite dramatic also, just like histrion histrionic, but a key component in, in narcissists or narcissistic tendencies is that they lack empathy. Yeah. And they have very low emotional connection. Their ability to connect with people is very low emotionally. I mean, to connect with people emotionally is very low. It's not that they do not have emotions. They have emotions, 
but they would rather run away from that. Yeah. All right. And they're very self-centered. Actually, most narcissistic layman language people say the person is very selfish. selfish. Yeah. And full of self. All right. Mm. And then we have what you call the cluster C personality disorders. Here we have the anxious. We are, they are described as being anxious and fearful in their thinking and in their behaving. Yeah. And under this the avoidant personality, we also have the dependent personality disorder. And then we also have the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. All right. Yeah. And maybe today we will, we cannot tackle all of them. All of them. Week. Yes. <laughs> probably about yeah those that present the most yes okay yeah so we had talked about the narcissistic and the uh, dependent personalities so you know yeah maybe you could just give us a description and then yeah just a description when we talk about the dependent personality i really try and be very simple because yeah. we are speaking to the general population not the clinical yeah. population yeah and in Describing this, all right. So when we talk about the dependent personality, this is a person that has um, tendency. And so oh. let me let me make a clarification. Dependent doesn't mean you depend on people for livelihood because we tend to confuse that. It's not mm -hmm. the dependent of a child on a mother or an elderly parent on the on adult children. That's not what it means. It means uh, this person's validation comes from external sources sources yeah okay. this person's sense of affirmation comes from external sources they consistently have a feeling of inadequacy or ineptness even mm. when they are high achievers yeah. in their relationships especially uh, relationships they have they tend to feel very inadequate even when there's evidence that they are well achieved all right yeah. Then there is a tendency to be other people-centered. Maybe from a Christian perspective, somebody may ask, what is wrong with that? We are supposed to be mindful of other people. Other people, yeah. But all you care about is other people's needs and invalidate your own needs. Yeah. You're running empty. It needs to be balanced. I think the big commandment is very clear. It says, love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And, your soul, and, love, strength. Your and love yourself, your neighbor as yourself. So yeah. self-love is selfish, all right? Uh, and they tend to be people pleasers because their validation and affirmation comes from external factors then they will do anything within their power to play other people, all right? Mm -hmm. They are also driven by a need to be in control. Yeah. And maybe no wonder then they become rescuers. So they are not good at offering support. They rescue. Mm -hmm. Rescue means they can overdo stuff for other people, but these other people will still resent them because when you do stuff for people, you disempower them. Helping is good, enabling is bad. Mm -hmm. okay. Support empowers, rescue disempowers. So you find a lot of dependent people feeling, people around in their lives are ungrateful. Yeah. But they will appear they are ungrateful because you have culture and, and enabled dependency and they hate it. No human being is created to want to be rescued. You know that, Carol. Yeah, yeah. We get human dignity in doing things for ourselves. And the best way to help somebody is allow them to do what they can for themselves. So those are basically, in general, some of the traits of a dependent. A narcissist which is the other one you asked about, would be almost like the opposite. They are egocentric. They are very gradious in their approach to one's life. They are big. They yeah. don't come so eh? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, are, they are big in many. They will talk big, live big, behave big, if, whether it's within their means or not. Their graduosity is not always quantified. They, there may not be any evidence for it. You know, there's a person who lives big and there's evidence for it. They, they have the means. They have the means yeah. to live the big. Yeah. 
okay, this one they may not be, but that's how they feel. But what is very, what makes them very difficult to live with is their lack of empathy, their lack of emotional connectedness, where the ability to connect with other uh, people, because without empathy in a relationship and the emotional connection, then that relationship really will hurt. One person will feel taken for granted. And you can almost imagine who they attract. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we, yeah, we were saying that uh, opposites attract, get attracted yeah. to one another. And so we have the narcissistic and the dependent personality disorder people coming together. So just describe to us how how they fall in love how how does that happen how does you know how does this dependent person fall in love with um this you know the narcissist who we have said has very little emotion and empathy and thinks about themselves and how does that just tell us just <laughs> describe for us a scenario of how they fall in love <laughs> I, I really like that question because that's a very common a uh, combination that we get in therapy among many other combinations but let's talk about this one in particular remember a dependent gets a lot of external validation is not mm -hmm. able to validate themselves all right uh is also a people placer and is willing to go an extra mile to make other people happy to mm -hmm. serve to forget their needs and meet the needs of these people. This dependence on the people when they come in therapy unless they're already in the process of healing. When you ask them what makes you feel loved, they don't know. Oh, wow. They know what makes other people feel loved. Yeah. When you ask them what do you want, they don't know. Yeah. Because they've never posed to think about themselves. You know, they are so centered on making another person happy. Now, this narcissist we are saying has no empathy, is very egocentric, has no emotional connection, is also in simple terms called, by in layman language, we call them charmers. They're very charming people. Oh, they're charming. Okay. They come off as very confident. They will tell you all the right things when you're starting Dating. out yeah. they will buy you all the right things you know they are able to do everything right and if this, that's a need i have which i've not found a way to feel it for myself what yeah. happens i become very easily, easily enticed if i want to make a want of cushion here and say before you're going to marriage know what you want and try and meet those needs for yourself so mm -hmm. that you're not operating on a very superficial level of gifts and you run for the gift without even questioning the source of the gifts. So when they come to you, they pamper you, they treat you right, and it feels very beautiful for a dependent because a dependent is almost that person who doesn't know what it means, what it feels like to be served. Because yeah. they are all having other yeah. The sad thing is that it's not sustainable. Mm. It appears like the moment now the relationship gets, you know, firmed up. Yeah. They, this partner goes back to their normal. Yeah. Who yeah. Who is egocentric, no empathy, yeah. pursuing their own things. And where are you left? In the misery of feeling not good enough, putting an effort every day to win them back, serving yeah. them over and over. And by the time they come in therapy, Pastor Caro, they are a wreck. They yeah. come in having developed codependency where they have completely sacrificed their needs for yeah. the sake of people's needs sometimes mm. suffering burnout sometimes they have suffering depression some women even their hair has fallen out wow. some have weight skin which they cannot explain where it's yeah. coming from some yeah. are feeling very inept at the yeah. workplace because mm. a dependent personality is not only a dependent personality in the relationship, it also transfers in the workplace. You find that both who does the work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So by the time they are coming, they are really in bad shape. Now, I know as I'm explaining, I'm sounding very gender biased. I'm sounding like there are more narcissists among men than and women. Than and women. And yeah. No. And it can be. You can also have narcissistic women. Yeah. Okay. You can have narcissistic women, you can have narcissistic men, you can have code, uh, dependent men and yeah. dependent women. So uh, I need to 
apologize for sounding like I'm very inclined to one side, though the common trend we find is what is easily leaving my tongue, which is that you find more of the men being narcissistic and marrying dependent women. De very dependent women. Okay, so okay, so 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 what are some of the presenting issues? You've described how they, they, they might come, you know, the symptoms, but what are some of the presenting issues? Is there violence, is there infidelity? Uh, is there a lack of care, a lack of love? You know, so what are some, what, how, how will a couple, what are some of the presenting issues for the couple? You, you've even already highlighted them. Infidelity is very rampant among people who have narcissistic tendencies. Yeah. You see, Carol, empathy is a very great virtue to have because what it does, yeah. it makes you put yourself in other people's shoes. Mm -hmm. Empathy makes you keep your conscience al alert and alive. Mm -hmm. It makes you examine any action that you're taking, that it's not only about your self-gratification, what impact will it have on another person? So if you're living with someone who has silenced that component of that attribute of a human being, they yeah. are likely to change in so many things and come to you completely with no remorse, no, in fact, mm -hmm. a lot of ladies who come in therapy, mm -hmm. even when being abused, whether it's sexually or emotionally or psychologically, the person would deny it outrightly and say, I never wow. did that. Oh, yes. really? oh. We have situations where uh, a person has evidence of infidelity, maybe hotel bookings, communication, chats later or from whoever partner it was explaining what the experience was like. Oh, wow. And, therapy and tell you, I don't know where she got that from. So what happens, a lot of women feel insane. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's how depression comes in. Because unless, I don't know what evidence they will, you will come and say he's doing it. They are condescending. Narcissistic personalities yeah. are Sending behavior. Yeah. So even as talking, the, yeah. the partner is talking, they will be sneering, they will be yeah. making faces, they'll be doing many things. So I want to say something to you, Pastor Carol, that will shock you. Yeah. Any couple therapist will tell you you are likely to achieve nothing in couple therapy if you put an narcissistic partner and a dependent partner in the room together. together. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Because the narcissist runs the show and leaves the other person feeling very depleted. Oh, wow. And unless you have the skill to see past their eloquence and the ability to deny and paint themselves in very good light, you know how good of providers they are and where they mm. live and what they have done, you mm. can miss them, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you ask what brings them infidelity is common, Abuse is common, especially psychological and emotional abuse. They yeah. may not be violent, they may not beat, but occasionally they may. Yeah. Negligence is common, abandonment is common. Negligence and abandonment means this person can have days unaccounted for. Yeah. They will tell you, I have gone on a work assignment. You come to learn later, this work assignment was two days, but they were away for a week. Oh, wow. Completely unreach and, uh, and, and unreachable. Uh, yeah. They are the kind of people who can fill up their wardrobes with uh, very beautiful things, but the spouse and the children are ragged and they don't see anything wrong with that. All right? Wow. wow. To do it. Yeah. Now, the data is some of them are, so that means that they are the, the only person who experiences them is the partner. Yeah. They are not known outwardly. So outwardly mm. to the in-laws, to the sisters-in-laws, the parents, wow. oh, they are wonderful people. So yeah. this part person doesn't even know where to break the silence. Yeah. Because when you go home, is their adult son-in-law? Yeah. Most is their adult brother-in-law. Where do yeah. you break the silence? So imagine the woman who comes to therapy is a very silenced woman. Yeah. My experience has been this is a person who will come and the moment you begin talking about their marriage, yeah. they will cry. They just break down. Yeah. And they cry even for a whole hour 
because mm. what is playing back you see by the time they are coming to therapy yeah. they have realized it's not okay yeah but by the time they realize years have passed they've lost themselves yeah. in this aspect until they don't know what they want anymore so they yeah. weep and yeah they underappreciate themselves in fact when they come to therapy mm. uh, the partners who have dependency uh, the personality they hardly speak about their problems yeah they speak about their inadequacies when they come in therapy they come complaining about what do i do i am not good mm. enough i'm wow. not able to be happy why is he cheating on me i've gone to the gym i'm trying to lose weight i cook i do i do oh, wow. why am i not good? they concentrate on what can I do to make him or her stay? Happy. Yes. Because all they need to feel is very inadequate. Yeah. They actually break when you look at them. And that's great. Mm. It's passed on to the children. They are not able to get many come crying because they've lost many valuable milestones of their children. They missed out. Yeah. Because they didn't feel like those need to celebrate anything. Yeah. They just living like in a state of limbo and the more the sad thing carol is that when there's a partnership between a narcissist and a dependent personality yeah they look the dependent partner goes yeah more accelerated than the narcissistic partner gets oh really what, they what do you mean their joy yeah eating you oh wow so the more you sink in depression, the more you, you, you know, neglect self-care, mm. the more you're not happy, yeah. the more they appear to now even get away more, get into extramarital relationships more, talk to you in very demeaning ways. Yeah. yeah. Because they are joy in hurting you. You know the Ooh. lack of empathy you talk about? Yes. And the more they hurt to, the more the dependent who hasn't realized this is a problem, puts yeah. effort to mm. win the partner back. Yeah. yeah. So it's really a cycle. Oh my goodness. Carol, it just it sounds terrible. It, it just really sounds terrible. Um, my goodness. And and so I'm assuming that in therapy you're going to get the dependent personality coming in and not so much the narcissistic. And maybe what I could ask is, um, what hope is there for the dependent person? You know, what hope is there for them to grow? And what hope is there for their marriage? Excellent. Yes, you're right that you're likely to have more of the dependent person seeking help and be, be adhering to therapy more. Yeah. The narcissistic person may come or may not come. And when they come, it's good to say not every couple therapist can handle those two personalities. And it is good for people to be honest. Yeah. And if you're not able to, don't destroy them more. Because the person you're likely to destroy is actually the, the dependent. dependent. Yeah. When they feel invalidated in the therapy room, they get silent. And it's easy to go back and carry on with life as normal because they've been invalidated and that's all they've grown up. Uh, feeling all right mm -hmm. what hope is there uh let me be honest and say carol there's hope for personality disorders as much as they are rigid but when they are high when the symptoms are high in the assessment spectrum because we have cutoffs yeah. you see there you have cutoffs of hb the hemoglobin when you're measured you're told you're below or you're okay increasing this we also have cutoffs in our assessments yeah. the higher the spectrum there is the more the difficulty in change all right so when they come into therapy if they are both um cooperative you have to work with each individually because their manifestations are very different so let me talk about the hope in the dependent personality number one they have to learn i don't know if i'll be able to talk about this before I let me say one of the ways that the dependency comes in is the background you have grown in you are raised because yeah. our personalities yeah mentioned by the time we are 12 13 yeah, yeah. so chances that you are raised in a background where maybe everything was provided for yeah. in terms of 
material and physical provisions, but there was emotional negligence. Mm -hmm. By emotional negligence, I mean there was no validation. Nobody paid attention to what to feel or do not feel. Nobody checked or knew. When you expressed your feelings, were they affirmed or were they downplayed? Do you know those things mm. you're told grow up? That is childish, this and yeah. that. Yeah. So if you come from a background where there is a lot of invalidation, yeah. when you come into therapy, we are not centering on you getting validation from your partner because that is what you have been pursuing and that is what is going to cause you more pain. So yeah. where do we begin? This person as first ha must first admit to themselves, I am dysfunctional in the way I think, yeah. in the way I functioning and the way I am behaving. All right. My parents are not to blame. Yeah. Therapy does not apportion blame. When you come and we say you grew up being invalidated, it is not so that you can go and get angry at your mother or mm -hmm. angry at your father. You know the things people use as father wounds and mother wounds. Mm -hmm. It is not that. It is actually to help you cut them some slack and realize they raised you in the best way they knew mm -hmm. how to, yeah. the knowledge that they had. And if they were broken themselves, then they may have broken you. Mm -hmm. So you forgive them and release them. Yeah. Then you ask the next question, what do I do? I am now 25. I am now 30. I am now 40. I will never go back to my mother's laps to be affirmed and validated so that I can learn how to affirm and validate myself. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? you do what we call self-parenting. Mm -hmm. Self-parenting is ask, what did I grow up lacking? Yeah. And begin to give it to yourself. Yeah. Begin to say, I'm good enough. Begin to look at the mirror and see something good, not the ugly image you've been told you are. Yeah. Begin to look your children and even with all the imperfections you're feeling in the parenting say i have done my best under the circumstances and mm -hmm. i can only get to better because there's a chance tomorrow so begin to focus on you yeah. and give yourself the things you are looking for in your partner and he has continuously continued to deprive them of you yeah. or from you or from giving you. Because, by the way, if you cannot give them to yourself, Caro, can I tell you, if you cannot affirm yourself or validate yourself, mm -hmm. even when somebody gives it to you, you will not recognize it. Yeah, it's true. Because you don't know what it looks like, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So healing must really focus on you. It's not self-centered. Yeah. But once you do that, the next key thing is we train this codependent how to create boundaries. Yeah. healthy boundaries in the relationship. Remember I told you when they come in therapy and you ask them what do you want, they can hardly answer that question because mm -hmm. they have never focused on their needs and their wants. They mm -hmm. don't know what they want. So you mm -hmm. have to train them to validate what they, that their needs are okay. It's okay mm -hmm. for them to need it and accept it. Then create boundaries that allow them to have that fulfilled. I will mm -hmm. give you an example. Yeah. So you've come in therapy because you're battling with patho pathological cheating. Pathological means continuous. Yeah. Generally, I forgive you for infidelity. June, I forgive you for infidelity. 2013, I forgive you for infidelity. 2020, we are still dealing with infidelity. So mm. I will ask this person in therapy, what is the value of fidelity to you as yeah. a person? Yeah. Isn't it? Mm. Because if you value it, then you need to communicate it. Yeah. All right? Mm. Because it is a boundary. A boundary is not a control measure to your partner. Mm. A boundary is communicating what would make, make you feel accepted and appreciated as a human being. When mm. you communicate a boundary, you have full knowledge that you don't have what it takes to make the other person fulfill it because you cannot control them. But yeah. you have full control over yeah. the consequences and the behavior patterns you embrace when those yeah. boundaries are broken. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So like in, in couple therapy, it's not unusual mm. to find a lady who has been going through, in fact, I get calls sometimes from gynecologists because you find a lady who has gone through a series of treatment for maybe venereal diseases over and over, 
but still continues having intimacy and protected, even if you have full knowledge, this person is cheating on you. Oh, wow. So oh, where, wow. where does the boundary? The boundary, <laughs> the boundary is saying, I am very happy to have intimacy with you because you're my partner. But this would be safer for me if you're practicing fidelity. Yeah. If you're not able to, I will release you to do what it oh. is that you want to do. Yes. Because you don't have control over them. Yeah, but that's there are true. Some things I must stop doing with you. Yeah. Because how long can will you be treated? Yeah. I, I don't know. I know I've used a very gross example, but isn't that the reality of what that you That is the reality. Yes, it is. It is, yeah. The little boundary would be I I am a respectful person. I like respectful communication. You yeah. don't use derogatory terms with me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I really love it or like it if when you're speaking to me you speak calmly you don't need to shout yeah communicate it yeah if with the other part, person honor it we don't know but yeah. if they don't honor it what do you do so that you're not breaking down all the time yeah yeah you can move yourself from the environment kindly and say i will come back we have the communication when you come up yeah because we cannot communicate this so we the hope is Teach them to affirm themselves, teach them to create boundaries. But third, very key, is you teach the dependent self-care. Yeah. Okay? All mm -hmm. the components of self-care. Self-care mm -hmm. is not selfish. They break down and they get weary because they're running on empty. Yeah. You're so partner that you take care of yourself. Yeah. How about beginning to do it concurrently. Self-care doesn't mean you neglect the other person. It's continue yeah. taking care of you, but remember yourself. In fact, I like saying self-care means remember yourself. Yourself. Yeah, that's true. Remember yeah. yourself. And yeah. I know you may be wanting to know, does this person pray? <laughs> yeah. 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 You want to ask me that, I, I guess. Yeah. The, the place for prayer in all this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, what is the prayer for in all this, especially when we talk about personality disorders, because now we're talking about ourselves, you know, it, uh, and we had said that in personality disorders, it's the way that we were raised and, you know, the brokenness that was in our homes, that was inevitable, that is, in, indeed, it's inevitable because we are all broken people. So mm -hmm. where is the place, of, where is the place for prayer? There's a place for prayer. And what I love about prayer, from my own understanding of prayer, is not a communication to manipulate God mm. or to steer him in any direction. For me, I see prayer as a place of total surrender. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It is actually saying, God, I do not have control over this yeah. person. Yeah. I cannot change them. Yeah. I cannot any, I cannot make them be anything I desire them to be, yeah. but you're able to conform their hearts, yeah. you're able to transform their minds. And actually asking for grace, yeah. either to stay and cope, but also for wisdom to know what is the next step of action, yeah. should it be planned, and especially where there's abuse yeah. and violence. All right. So yeah. this is how I look at the place for prayer. If you call yourself a Christian, Part and parcel of us, mm -hmm. and if there are people we pray for most, it's our friends, including yeah. our partners, our spouses. But I look at it not as a manipulative agenda, but a place of total surrender. It's saying, Give me the acceptance yeah. to live okay? without yeah. the need to control or change anything because only you yeah. can do that. And I think that is where one of the areas of our healing when we are able to let go of what is not within our scope of control. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wow, Carol, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for, um, you know, just taking us through this, uh, helping us understand, you know, in the first video what mental illness is, and now in this uh, second part of it, just understanding what personality disorders are about. And thank you even with the personality disorders, because not everybody listening to this 
would be able to access you know the services of a counselor uh, but you know you leave us with a very strong hope of you know there's actually the place to pray to pray there's actually a place to uh, to, uh, to pray uh, not as something manipulative there's a place to actually surrender to God and to say you know what I cannot do this uh, on myself on my own uh, and I need you I need you to heal me to deliver me uh, and I need you and so that that is so that is so helpful and indeed that's how we're going to end in that prayer uh, but before we we close with that prayer I'd, I'd just like to say if you're listening to this and um, you'd like to receive prayer or you'd like to join you know, a community of people who will support you in your journey as you're seeking to grow uh, as, as, you know, in, as, as an individual. You might not even be a believer and you're like, my goodness, I'd love to, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to know who God is and who this God is uh, and I'd love support in whatever way. Then there's a link there below that uh, you can click. There's a number, there's a WhatsApp number that you can join um, in the Mavuno WhatsApp community and you can indicate you know what kind of help that you need you can even indicate exactly where you live because then a pastor near you will will give you a call uh and uh yeah just to say that yeah i would love to work with you would love to to support you in whatever way that we can uh so thanks again carol for just explaining to us so so well about personality disorders i know you've only mentioned two I hope that I can you know, we can have another conversation at another time where we discuss you know the other personality disorders. There are also other mental illnesses that we didn't talk about, like bipolar and um, uh, schizophrenia. You know that are a bit on the extreme. I'm truly hoping, Carol, that another time you will avail yourself and that we can have this conversation. So thank you so much um, just for your time. So I'd like to end in prayer. Uh, uh, and to close out this time and especially for the person who recognizes oh my goodness i am narcissistic you know uh, because there are those people who will say you know what i do recognize i don't have empathy for people i do recognize that i might even be you know uh, just not treating my spouse correctly and that's a man or a woman you know i recognize that and i do need help uh, or you might be listening to this and saying oh my goodness i am dependent I'm totally dependent on my spouse for my emotional well-being and, and even for my validation. And uh, I would want to say is that imagine God is able. God is able to help you. Uh, indeed, the word of God just tells us God, God is the one who heals us. God is the one who delivers us. And I think the first place uh, that we need to, to, or the first thing that we need to do is to come before him and tell him, you know what, I do not have what it takes to even run my own life. I do not have what it takes to change myself. Because right now we're talking about personality disorders. I do not have what it takes. And I know for myself, I do pray for myself. There are those things that I know, I don't have what it takes to change myself. And I really thank God that he takes us as we are and that he helps us grow. So uh, let's just close in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you that when you created us, you know us, each of us by name. I thank you that even as we've been talking with Carol, some of us have, have come to uh, even understand some of our personality disorders and can be quite dismayed at what she has talked about because we recognize things that we are not proud of and things that we are not even happy about ourselves. But I thank you that in knowing us, you know our issues. I thank you that there is nowhere that we can go where you do not see us. Indeed, we, you are, uh, that we are ever before you. Uh, uh, just the way that we are, whether we are proud of ourselves or not, that you know us. But more than that, that you love us and that you accept us. And that you, you're the one who changes us and that you're the one who heals us. And so for every one of us, we come before you uh, praying, Lord, that you will change us. You alone are able to change us. We do not have that power to change ourselves, but we come to you and we say, Lord, uh, change us, heal us and deliver us um, in whatever uh, situation that we find ourselves in. And we thank you, Lord, that you're faithful and we thank you, Lord, that you're able to help us. And so, Father, we thank you for this time that we have had. We ask, Lord, that even as we uh, you know, um, uh, uh, look at the rest of the week, 
We ask him, Father, for your presence and that you'd enable us to learn to hear you and learn to pray to you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. So thank you, Carol, so much for being with us. Uh, as I said, I hope we can do this again. Uh, for everyone who is listening, uh, I hope that this has been helpful for you. And uh, I think the big thing or the big takeout that I have is that it's possible to walk with other people. It's not just uh, counseling. Counseling is really good. It's really helpful. But you might not be able to afford it at this particular time. But you can join a community of people who will pray with you uh, and who will support you as you seek to grow. So until next week, uh, God bless you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks and see you. Mm-hmm.